Hey everyone, this is Bradley Bush again with another algebra video for you. Today we're talking about relations and functions, and really I'm trying to cover the basics, trying to pull in a lot of different things so that you can get a really solid foundation that is pretty broad about relations and functions. So let's talk about the to-do list. Today we'll talk about relations, the definition, we'll talk about the definition of a function, I'll give you definitions of domain and range, I have a separate video that goes very in depth into a lot of domain and range options for all the type of function representations. So here we have a basic definition and some discussion. But if you want a more in depth video, check out my domain and range, the ultimate video in my algebra playlist. And we'll talk about the vertical line test. So what is a relation? Well, a relation is actually one of the loosest or, or least restrictive constructs that, that we have. All that is important is that you have two items. So you have an ordered pair, and that means it's important which is the first element and which is the second element, meaning their place. The first element's got to go on the left, and the second element has to go on the right and they can't switch places. But that's all there is. You have a grouping of two, two pieces of information, a first element and a second element. They can't trade spots, but they don't have to be related in any other fashion. They can be completely random things. The set of all the first elements is called the domain, and the set of all the second elements is called the range. So for example, we could have a set the set's delineated by these curly brackets of three different ordered pairs. So 0, 1, 3, 4, and 6, negative 2. They don't have to be related in any fashion. There's no rule saying what can or can't go in the first and second elements. Just a bunch of two pieces of information stuck together in, in a group. So that's a relation. So here I give you... Um, a relation, I say find the domain and the range. So this specific relation has a bunch of names in the first element and their corresponding ages in the second element. Here the ages and the names are related, but they don't have to be. These could be re completely random ages and completely random names. So the domain, of course, takes all the names. So John uh, is the first item, Mary is the second, Corey is the second third, and the names, or sorry, the ages, 25 is the first, 30 is the second, 19 is the third, and so forth, and we just list them all. So that's how you find the domain range of a relation. So what is a function? So this is actually a pretty simple definition, but it's pretty powerful. So a relation we've discussed above is just a pairing of two pieces of information. First piece and second piece. A function is a relation without repeating first elements or repeating inputs. So the first elements can be called inputs. They are often in algebra represented by x. And they can also be called in the independent variable. X is the independent variable. The second elements are often called outputs. Y is generally rep the variable representing the output. And it's also called the dependent variable because you choose the X. The X goes into the function kind of like this machine, kind of like a gumball machine. If you have a handful of coins and have a handful of quarters, you take you get to choose the quarter you put in, so it's independent. You get to choose it. But once you put it in, crank the knob, uh, the machine tells you what gumball comes out. So it's kind of like functions. The function tells you what y comes out once you choose the x that you put in. So it's called a dependent variable. So as long as this relation does not have repeating inputs or repeating first elements, it's considered a function. That's it. Is this relation a function? 
Well, we go back to our definition. Does it have repeating inputs? Well, let's check. We have a 0 here. We have a 10. And we've got a 0 again. So we have issues right here. We have repeating inputs. So the answer to this is simply no. It's not a function. And the reason, because we have repeating inputs. Something else we should discuss are the definitions of domain and range. So for the domain, the domain is defined as the set of all possible inputs. And the range would be the set of all possible outputs. Pretty simple, huh? Let's talk about some function notation. Sometimes students get this confused and they think that here we are actually multiplying f by x. Function notation isn't the same as, as multiplication. So these parentheses, even though we use parentheses, sometimes when we're multiplying, like for example, five times two, that is, those are parentheses, but they're used in a different context. In the context of addition, multiplication, division, parentheses can mean multiplication. But in the context of function notation, the parentheses simply go around the input. So remember, our function is like a gumball machine. We're putting in something. We're putting in a quarter. So the parentheses just tell you, they identify what the quarter is. They identify what the input is. Everything inside the parentheses, that's the input or the independent variable. So we have the input inside the parentheses. The parentheses just delineate or identify what the input is because the parentheses, it's everything inside the parentheses. So the parentheses go around everything that's going into the function. And then the function has a name. And this function is named f. But you can name it literally anything you want. You could name it Fred. You could name it George. You could name it G. You could name it H. You really can have any name you want. Oftentimes in algebra, they use f for a function, but that is just their choice. You can use any one you want. And I like kind of fun function names, personally. So when we're looking at our functions, there are actually four ways to represent a function. If we took this function um, 2x plus 1, we can represent that four different ways. So let's talk about each of the different ways. The first thing that we could do is we could say, well, we could describe it verbally. And when we described it verbally, we would say, well, we take the x and we multiply it by 2, and then we add 1. And there you go. We just described it verbally. We don't see the verbal representation of functions very often, but it's an option. The second one is the numerical representation of a function. We do see this very often. You can either see this through um, an xy chart where you have a bunch of inputs. You plug those inputs into the function and get a bunch of outputs. Or they could just give you a list of ordered pairs that represent your function. And notice this is indeed a function because we don't have repeating inputs. So the third way that we could represent this function is symbolically, meaning they could give us the functional form of the equation. So they will have f of x, which is function notation, equals, and then they'll give us the actual equation. So sometimes you'll see this, but instead of an f of x, 
you'll see maybe a Y up top instead of the F of X. And that's okay. That's not using function notation. That's just using standard equation notation for a line. But it's the same idea. You have a physical equation that represents your function. So this is used very, very often. In fact, probably the most often I see a symbolic representation of a function in algebra. The last way that we can represent this function is graphically. I could just give you the graph right here of the function and not tell you what it was. For Meaning, I would give you this graph, but I wouldn't say this is y equals 2x plus 1. I would just give you the red line and that's it. So that's also a way you can represent a function. Finally, let's talk about the vertical line test. So the vertical line test, you may have used the vertical line test over and over and over again in your algebra pursuits, but not really understood why you're using it. You just use it and you know how to use it. So let's see, hopefully, my hope is that I can connect something here for you that will be new. So the definition of the vertical line test, if a vertical line intersects the graph of a curve more than once, then the curve is not a function. That's probably what you know already. You probably have used this, this vertical line. You're like, hey, can I place this vertical line anywhere? And so if I looked down here at this example, um, I could say, well, hey, look, at there's a vertical line. There's a vertical line. All of those vertical lines touch more than once. So this is obviously, this red curve is obviously not a function. But I want to take it one step further. Remember our definition of a function. What was our definition of a function? The definition of a function was a relation without repeating inputs. You remember that? Let's get back to it up here. A function was a relation without repeating inputs. So vertical lines have a unique characteristic. And it's this. Everywhere on the vertical line, every point on this vertical line has one thing in common. That one thing is its input. Every point on that line has the same input. Because notice, I have two green dots here, points. These green points are on the vertical line, but they're also touching the curve. What do you notice about these green points? Look at the input. The input's the same. The top point is 1, 4, and the bottom point is 1, negative 3. They have the same input. So the reason a vertical line can tell you if, if a curve is a function or not is because a vertical line is kind of like a metal detector, but it doesn't detect metal. A vertical line is a repeating input detector because any point that touches that vertical line will have the same input. So anytime you take a vertical line and touch it, and it touches some curve more than once, every one of those points has the same input. So really, this is identical. This whole idea of the vertical line test is identical to the definition of a function, which is a function is a relation without repeating inputs. It's just a visual way. The vertical line test is a visual way to find easily, without even knowing the coordinates of the points, it's a visual way to find repeating inputs. Because again, any part of the curve that touches that vertical line has the same input. Because all points on a vertical line have the same input. 
and that's it. That's your basic introduction to functions and relations. Hope you enjoyed it. Let me know what you think. And have fun mathing.